Okay, good evening, friends. This is Des Buford. I'm the Corporate Relations and Events Manager for Horizons Foundation. And I'm honored to welcome you all tonight to our virtual State of the LGBT Movement. Before we get started, um, would like to um, make a couple quick housekeeping announcements. I know um, it's been a very turbulent year and full of unprecedented times, and we're honored that you would all take the time to join us for this very important discussion tonight. tonight during tonight's State of the Movement, all attendee mics are muted and your videos are off to be able to cut out on background noise and ensure we can clearly hear our panelists. We have cart captioning available. Uh, to access that captioning, you can either in um, Zoom click on the close cut, the CC icon or button at the bottom to activate those, or we also will be putting um, a helpful link in the chat if you want a full screen um, caption experience. Uh, your views, you'll be able to toggle your view between gallery view or speaker view, and when we're sharing a slide, it'll be side by side. We highly recommend the gallery views. So you can see all of our wonderful panelists. Tonight, we'll be using the Q&A tool so folks can submit their questions to our panel. Many of you have already submitted some amazing and excellent uh, thoughtful questions in advance. So we have um, quite a few in the hopper, but if other things strike your fancy, please use that Q&A tool. And then lastly, the chat tool is available for folks to reach us um, on the back end. If you have any technical issues and need any tech support, we're here to help. Uh, lastly, this session is being recorded and will be distributed via email. I am now delighted to pitch it over to Roger Dowdy, Horizons president and our moderator for tonight's discussion. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you, Des, and thank all of you for joining us here tonight. Bringing Community Together has been a part of Horizons Foundation for the past 40 years, since we were founded in 1980. And for those of you who might be a little bit less familiar with Horizons, Horizons is an LGBTQ community foundation founded 40 years ago, and we bring together donor, individual donors, foundation partners, corporate partners, and people from throughout the community, along with hundreds and hundreds of LGBTQ community organizations and other nonprofits that support, serve, and advocate for the LGBTQ community. And last year, we were privileged to grant out nearly $6 million. Those, uh, some of you may also have heard it said that those who live in historic times, it's hard to tell you're living in historic times. And because it's just like the sun comes up, the sun goes down, you go about your day, there's no real perspective. It just feels like daily life. And yet in the past four years, I suspect that many of us have felt very clearly that we are living in historic times. And frankly, for pretty much all of the wrong reasons, because it has been a time of, of, of grave retrenchment of resurgent white supremacy, of callousness, of treating truth as though it were merely an option. And this past year, of course, it has been only even more so with a devastating pandemic, with intense hardship for millions of people in the US, in the US alone, not to mention around the world. What seems like a nonstop tide of the killing of black people and the rise of the movement for racial justice, natural disasters, and so much more. And our community, the LGBTQ community, has been fighting all of these four years, fighting, 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 and sometimes only to just try to hold the line. And we've also had some thrilling victories like the Bostock decision last, um, just, just last summer, or the, the record number of LGBTQ people, especially transgender people, elected to public office. You know, tonight's event follows a long tradition. Horizons has been holding the State of the Movement event since 2003, so I believe that makes this the 18th State of the Movement event. And some of you may remember back to 2016, four years ago, when we gathered, and frankly, we were, many of us were shell-shocked. But we gathered, and what was wonderful about it was that we could be together, because we could be in community. And tonight, as we gather with tonight's panelists, I think we do so in an atmosphere of greater hope. There's more hope in the air and I suspect that out there, even though I can't see you right now, that there are more smiles on faces. And for no other reason that then the names of the president-elect and the vice president-elect are Biden and Harris. So this tradition also includes bringing truly stellar leaders from the movement together. And tonight is absolutely no exception. We are so honored and so privileged 
to have the four of you with us tonight. So I would like to welcome now uh, Chris Hayashi, the Executive Director of the Transgender Law Center, Kira Johnson, the Deputy Director and Incoming Executive Director of the National LGBTQ Task Force, Imani Rupert Gordon, the Executive Director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and Issa Noyola, the Deputy Director of Mihente. Thank you all for taking the time and for being with us here tonight. And so the scheme of tonight, after I ask just an opening question, I'll be directing some questions to each of you and also to you as a group. And then before long, we're going to move to the questions and answers because we've had more than 60 questions already submitted and I expect folks are also going to be submitting questions through the Q&A. So we wanna give a lot of time as much as we can to all of those questions. So, so let's get started, let's get started. And the place to start seems to be something big happened last week. The country had an election and all of you, you know, have read about it, heard about it, lived it, you know, every bit as much as, as I have. So, but from your seat, where you sit as a leader in the movement and as a leader in your organization, what are one or two of the truly like, most critical implications that you see from this election? And um, Imani, if I could start with you, that would be great. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Roger, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with these amazing panelists. I'm excited to be in conversation with all of you. Um, so honestly, this is representing a really amazing time in our community. Um, you know, we've seen this current administration really strip protections of LGBTQ people. And so the this incoming administration that's really made commitments to be the most inclusive, LGBTQ inclusive administration ever. Like I am here for it and super excited. You know, their campaign team, they've had um, folks from the LGBTQ community throughout their team an LGBTQ liaison, which has provided perspectives um, for their policies and their campaign uh, promises. Uh, Vice President-elect Harris's chief of staff was uh, a black queer woman and President-elect Biden has committed to having a more than 40% of his transition team represent communities that are historically underrepresented, so folks of color, people who identify as LGBTQ, folks with disabilities. This is really huge, and this is also the first time we've ever heard um, a president-elect thank um, folks, including gay and transgender people. This is the very first victory address that has mentioned transition uh, tra transgender people, and this is important, and I mention this because it matters how we frame our discussion. There's a video that's going around now about how supportive our current president is of LGBTQ people. Um, but we also know this administration saturated our courts with anti-LGBTQ inclusive judges. Uh, there have been horrible rules that discriminate against LGBTQ folks in healthcare and in homeless shelters. Um, and NCLR is suing uh, his administration right now for banning transgender folks from serving in the military. Uh, and then when you think about the fact that the military is the largest employer in the United States, you realize, really, you realize how sinister that is, that it's not just me, but it's actually contributing to the economic instability of some of the most underrepresented in our community. So, so this administration, this, this incoming administration has promised to end the trans-military ban on its very first day to pass the Equality Act. And we're excited to have a partner in this administration. You know, um, I think we've seen a lot of things that are just so incredibly detrimental. And now just the opportunity that had that to work with an administration that doesn't immediately just want to fight us. I mean, we just see a lot, uh, we just see a lot of opportunity and it's just really an exciting time. Great, well, thank, thank you so much, Imani. Um, Issa? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Her for Horizons, for having me. Um, Y'all have been a champion for trans liberation for so long. And um, on a local level, um, Ella Para Translatinas has benefited so much from your work, Transgender Law Center, so many trans org, TGIJP, so many folks and leaders in the movement. Um, so it's an honor to be here, and thank you for having me. Um, I, uh, there's so much to say, but I think one of the things that I've been reflecting is um, coming out of last week, um, the realization of the infrastructure of POC of led, uh, you know, political orgs and, you know, uh, black led PACs 
uh, feminist run organizations that are running electoral campaigns um, and communities that have not thrown their hat in the electoral ring, communities of color, immigrant communities, trans communities, uh, marginalized communities have gained so many, ha have gained that muscle, right, of running electoral campaigns and that knowledge of what it means um, and what's at stake on the local level um, and also on a federal level. And so to me, that's been one of the most amazing things that we've seen in the last four years is that our communities who have, you know, who have been left behind are saying, enough, we're going to do our own thing and we're going to run our um, candidates and we're going to, um, you know, frame the discussion and we're going to actually uh, vote on these other values that we have as a community. Um, so that's been exciting to see because I think we continue, like the infrastructure that has been left um, is powerful um, to continue to move a voting block that has been disenfranchised, that continues to be, you know, underfunded and ignored. You know, the Latinx community, the Black community, uh, trans communities continue to be left behind um, and we're catching up. And all of these projects and all of these orgs and this infrastructure is, is new. Um, and we're and we're you know kind of clawing our way out to understand what it takes to build political power on a local level and on a federal level. So that to me that is like an exciting venture and an exciting um, new journey that many organizations are taking. They're not just mm -hmm. um, they're you know they're not just settling to be a C three. They're actually saying we want to be a C four and actually we want to we want to run PACs. We want to endorse. We want to run endorsements and candidates. Um, so that's exciting to see, and I, I'm, I'm excited to see more organizations uh, jump in and throw their hat in the ring. Well, thank you for that perspective, Isa. That is incredibly exciting. It definitely is. Um, Chris, would you like to, to, to offer anything? And then I want to, of course, go out here and make sure that sure we hear from you out there in DC as well. So Chris? Yes, um, thanks so much. It's great to be here with everyone um, tonight. Uh, you know, I think I've done this um, this panel for a couple of years at this point, and it's definitely one of my um, favorite panels to do. And I will say this is probably one of uh, my most favorite. Um, so, you know, I really just want to echo what Imani and Issa said and say, and first just start by like really appreciating and raising up the Black folks, Indigenous, people of color, women, migrants, folks in the disability justice movement, Southern folks, who really made this win, who beat Trump, who made this possible. Um, and really knowing that it's years and decades of grassroots organizing um, that often went uh, unsupported that also made, uh, made this win possible. Um, you know, the other thing that I really think about when I think about last week and I think about the win um, is also just feeling so strongly that we need to stay diligent, knowing that the right, knowing that our opponents, um, knowing that we will see backlash, um, knowing that we will see likely um, increased hate violence. And for the trans community, we know that one form that's gonna take is that we are going to see um, more anti-trans legislation at the state level than we have ever seen before. Um, you know, we also know that you know, nearly half of the country supported a continuation of the Trump administration. So we need to stay diligent. We need to keep strong in terms of the work to really shift and change the culture of hate, intolerance, and violence that was deepened by the Trump administration. And the last thing I'll say is that, and I think this really um, builds off what Issa was talking about, is that we really need to build on the infrastructure that was created um, over the past year of, uh, of this election. And I, I wanted to just tell a very quick story. So, you know, for TLC, we're, we don't have a C4, um, we haven't historically done get out the vote work, but we were really clear that during the election, our lane was gonna be about the safety of trans people, about making sure that trans people um, were safe when we were seeing escalated violence, escalated hate violence, disenfranchisement at the polls, and knowing that trans people would be particularly vulnerable. So, you know, we, this was really clear to us when we organized a, a small call of trans leaders in the battleground states who were doing so much incredible work and had been for some time to really get out the vote to make sure trans folks knew their rights. 
And they really call the question. So what is the national infrastructure for trans folks in terms of voter protection, in terms of disenfranchisement? Is the larger um, voter protection number, the 866 number that everyone's been um, pointed to call, like have they been trained in terms of trans communities and how to work with us? Um, and so, you know, we started asking around to the larger movements, to our allies, and it was very, very clear that trans folks had been um, overlooked and that there were, there were huge gaps. So, you know, one of the calls we made was to the Equality Federation. And I just want to send out so much love and appreciation to the Equality Federation, to Viv Topping in particular, and to Equality Arizona, who I don't know how they did it, but within 48 hours, less than a week before election day, they pulled together a national hotline for trans folks to call to know their rights, um, if they were facing disenfranchisement. And to me, it was just another example of again and again, where trans folks are doing what it takes for our communities. And I just think moving forward, we really need to continue to build on that infrastructure um, and make sure that those gaps get filled moving forward. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for that, that perspective. Um, Kira, um, from out in, 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 in Washington, thank you for, for being up even, you know, a little bit later for us. Um, uh, I, please, would love to hear um, any thoughts that you, that you have on this. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm like the opposite of you, Chris. This is my first time doing this panel. I hope not my last. I'm like so excited. I have like a zillion notes. I'm like, and I'm going to say, and I'm going to say, and I'm going to say, but I'm not going to say all of it. Um, one of, I think, the biggest implications, um, and there are just so many, right? Roger, you were saying it's, you know, sometimes we don't know we're living in a historic moment, right? And we are definitely in it. And my guess is we're gonna be analyzing this time for decades, right, to come, right? Like the, there's so much learning from this time. I mean, the last four years, but even in this last like election season. Um, I think one of the biggest implications is that the status quo was not the winning strategy this election, right? Like, and, and again, I think some of my, some of the other um, panelists have said, right? Like, we have to be really mindful to the narrative of the narratives that get told, right? Like, it wasn't centrist, it wasn't moderate, right? That, you know, reelected Dana Carome, right? Or um, Andrea Jenkins, it wasn't, you know, that status quo that New Mexico has like the lady brigade going into Congress, right? Like, it, this is, that's not, that is quo, right? Um, and it, it's not status quo what's going on in Georgia. Um, I live in DC, but I'm a Georgia girl. I was born and raised in Valdosta. And, you know, again, people like to rewrite this history about Stacey Abrams and that campaign. That campaign got moving without the support of all the major, right? Like big political, right, entities that put big money behind those kinds of campaigns, right? And so, you know, we, we get told over and over again, it's not your time, right? It's not your time to run for office. I don't think the people are ready for your issue. I don't think we can, you know, door knock about that right now. The people aren't ready. And this election blew all of that out of the water. Like it, it's, it's not the people, it's us. Um, and I think it brings to light, like what, what are we so afraid of, right? To shake up, right? Like why are we so intent on projecting the need to stick to the status quo when the people have shown over and over again that they're ready, like they're ready for a shift. They're ready for the challenge. They're ready for a conversation, right? Like, you know, I used to organize in Alabama moons, many moons ago. And one of the things that, um, folks on these doors, and these are people who have lived in Alabama for generations, we would knock on their doors and they would say stuff like, I've lived here my whole life and nobody has ever knocked on my door. Nobody ever cared about my opinion. Nobody ever asked my opinion, yeah. right? So I think, um, you know, as a, as a deep South and I you know sometimes Georgia isn't considered deep South, but those are the people who are thinking about Atlanta, not Valdosta. Um, but, um, as a, as a homegrown, you know, it matters, um, how left of center people are thinking about us, right? Like, are we worthy of investment, right? And so often we hear our own people, our own funders, 
um, self-proclaimed liberal to progressive, like demeaning, belittling, being like degrading, right, to Southern folks, to, you know, Bible Belt, Rust Belt, Southwest, um, and, and it feels really good, right, to be, you know, Arizona and Georgia being battleground states, right? Like, we were like, we won that shit, right? Like, um, and, and I, what I hope is that we don't see a boom and bust situation from, uh, from donors, right, whether that's institutional or um, individual, but that has been the history, right, a boom bust, like Issa was talking about and, and Chris was talking about infrastructure, right, um, and if we would have had the infra infrastructure from the last year and a half, 40 years ago, I think we would have, a, I think we would have had a different scenario, and so I, I think we have to be really mindful about what it means to invest in people of color strategies, to invest um, in trans uh, folk strategies, to invest in working people strategies, to invest in rural strategies for the long haul, right? I, I understanding that that's the winning strategy, not doing it for a couple of months, right? Or even a couple of years. Uh, that's, that's so important to remember that, you know, none of this is just about one fight or one month or one election or anything like that is, it is all long term. It is all long term. So thank you so much. So I want to turn now to a, a few questions to to direct towards 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 each of you. And um, and it is part of my role here to keep an eye on my clock, which is sitting right over there. Um, and because we really want, do want to get to as many of the questions from the, the the audience as possible, we can all try to be our be our our, our, our most eloquent and concise best. That would be just lovely. Um, so I, I want to start actually with. Um, uh, going back to you, Kira, um, and I wanted to ask you about um, something that the task force and Horizons both believe in so deeply, which is the importance of, of grassroots organizations and of cross movement work. Um, and I'm not seeing the LGBTQ movement as like wholly separate from racial justice movement, from the repro justice movement, from other social justice movements. And I'm wondering at this you know moment, this this, you know, this point of of, of 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 change and shift. What do you see at, and the task force see as some of the priorities and, and possibly obstacles for such cross movement work now and, and just you know, looking down the pike over the next few years? That's not fair. And I got to be the one to try to keep it tight. I'm such no, a chatty I'm one. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just messing, Roger. I'm going to keep it tight. I got you, Roger. Um, I, I think one of the biggest obstacles is that. The, the, the LGBTQ movement, right, is seen as a winning movement, right? We won marriage, right? We won, um, you know, we've got these wins, right? Like here, you know, we've got a, a presidential candidate who's queer, right? Like, you know, out and get, like we've got these wins that people are like, oh, we busted that ceiling. Like y'all must be good, right? We see y'all on TV, y'all got shows, like, you know, and, and things must be okay. Um, and so I think for one of the things as a movement that we have got to um, be able to do is to disrupt that narrative for a broader, right, swath of, of the population, right? Like, and it's, it's both um, the face, right? Like looking at this panel, this is often not what people think of when they think of the LGBTQ community, right? Or population or movement. Um, and also in issues, right? Like, when people think of what is a queer issue, they're not thinking necessarily of what's the HUD, what's going on with HUD policy, right? Like they're not thinking about jobs. They're not thinking about homelessness outside of, right? They're not thinking about prison reform. And I don't mean within LGBT, right? Like outside, mm -hmm. our people are not the first folks who are thought of and, and not centered, right? And so I think that is a big um, obstacle. As far as um, an opportunity, um, I, I think that's also, right, the opportunity, right? You know, be, speaking and, and organizing and spotlighting at the intersections and making, you know, that visible, um, I think is going to align us um, in, in a way that only fortifies us. Um, I also think 
we're at a place where we have got to dig deep and go hard in democracy, right? Rebuilding our democracy, which is not necessarily, again, something people think of as an LGBTQ issue and, you know, voter disenfranchisement, um, civic participation, um, judges and courts, right? Like that, those are all things that directly impact us. And we haven't figured out yet how to invest in a way and get our constituents, right, our members, our communities, like invested and engaged um, in a way that makes uh, that makes it clear what's at stake. And, and I think that is going to be a linchpin for us over the next, I mean, easily, easily 20 years. Well, thank you. And that was a totally unfair question, I do confess. Um, but but many of my questions are going to be unfair because there's so much to say. And 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 so so next I'm going to be unfair to Romani. Um, so, um, so Imani, you know, NCLR has been at the forefront of our movement in so many ways and for, for the entire community, LGBTQI, um, you know, for decades and decades. And one of the areas, of course, that NCLR has always been a leader in, among many, is around the, the rights and, and, and the lives of LBT women. And so I wanted to ask you what you, when you've been in your role now, what, about eight months or so? I think yeah. something like that. And, and, and so what you see and, and what, what NCLR sees as some of the, the, the most important um, you know, issues and concerns um, that are facing LBT women at this time. Well, thank you so much, Robert, Roger. That's a, that's a great question. I wanna start by echoing what Kiera said. Honestly, we have to be inclusive and we have to be intersectional. And that is the only way that any of this works. Absolutely, every issue is an LGBTQ issue. And along those same lines is that um, anything that's affecting anyone is affecting women and folks marginalized by gender. So um, that is always something that we're thinking about. Um, one of the issues that we are paying particular attention to right now is the foster care system. And this is important because many people think about the foster care system um, as an LGBTQ issue exclusively because it's the way that many LGBTQ people start our families. But we know there's other things to consider there. Before we get to foster parents, we have to consider how children are being taken away from their families. These folks are uh, more likely to be LGBTQ people, but more specifically, they're more likely to be LGBTQ women and LGBTQ women of color. So um, the conversation that we're having around parenting, we aren't starting it soon enough. And that's an intersectional issue. You know, when we're framing this talking specifically about LGBTQ folks, and we're not thinking about the racial justice component that happens before that, that's an intersectional issue. We want to be careful there. Um, in our current foster care system, poverty is often confused for neglect. And if LGBTQ people are less likely to be deemed um, as fit parents, then what does that say for LGBTQ parents that are looking to get their kids back? So we are starting to work with other programs to help keep families intact. And if poverty is the problem, then what would it look like to provide funding for families so that they could take better care of their children? Um, if we start there, then we're in a stronger position to start looking at the foster care system. And so that's what we mean when we're doing our, our work intersectionally. Um, we know that this is going to be particularly important right now because last week we heard oral arguments about the Fulton versus uh, Philadelphia case. And I'm not um, an attorney and I work at a legal organization, so I always try to give some, some context. But for those that don't know, this is a decision that's going to determine if groups that receive public funding um, will be able to receive religious exemptions um, that will allow for this discrimination of LGBTQ people. It's kind of a bit confusing because um, a few years ago, we heard about that cake decision where private businesses could determine um, if they could in fact not make a wedding cake for a gay couple because of their religious beliefs. Uh, in this case, the uh, Catholic Social Services believes that they should be, um, that they should still be contracted by the city of Philadelphia to vet potential foster care parents, even though they violated the contract with the city's, um, the city's non-discrimination clause by refusing to consider LGBTQ people as foster parents. Um, Catholic Social Services believes that they should have, um, that they should really uh, receive a religious exemption because um, to be able to discriminate against LGBTQ people. And this case is gonna determine if federal funds can be used to actively discriminate against LGBTQ people. And we suspect that it's gonna have a broader implication for LGBTQ parents um, having their children taken away, but also getting their children back. And then also 
adoption and foster care. So religious exemptions are gonna be something that are being really big and something we're paying attention to, but specifically how that's happening because there's a racial justice component that is very often being left out of there. And I wanna make sure that we highlight that and that we're all, everyone on this panel, everyone listening, that that is something that we're paying attention to. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for that and those, 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 those important, important reminders. Um, you know, Chris, I've been so looking forward to asking you this question because it, gets, it allows me to refer to something that I just think is, is, is quite, is just deeply inspirational and visionary. Um, just to state the obvious, this has been a very tumultuous four years for uh, the transgender you know, community and for transgender folks. You know, relentless attacks and at the same time, just some, some unbelievable progress you know, that, that has made. And in the midst of all of this, the Transgender Law Center, your organization, came out with the, the, the Trans Agenda for Liberation. And for those of you who have not had a chance to, to see, this is a, a wonderful, wonderful, powerful visionary document it's on TLC's website. Um, and it refers among other things to the importance of, of, of centering uh, trans POC and the leadership of black trans women. It talks about making sure that people have the power to define themselves and control their bodies and have access to healthcare and the importance of different stages of life. And so, so Chris said, I'm only scratching the surface of that. So within this you know, a remarkable document and vision, where are some of the places right now where you're feeling like you're seeing some real progress? And, and, and again, where might there be a place where you're seeing like, wow, we've got, we've got a mountain to climb here. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, I, I did want to also just add a little bit off uh, what Imani was talking about in terms of the Fulton case. Um, and it connects to your question in that, you know, I just think we need to be really clear, right? That part of our opponent's strategy is using religion as a license to discriminate. So while the Fulton case, um, you know, is about a foster care, it, it is much, much bigger than that, right? It is an attempt by our opponents to use religion to be able to shed our rights and ultimately impact our lives. So I did, I just want to add that off of what Emily was saying. Um, so, you know, uh, what I'll say in addition to what I, I mentioned before, um, you know, the reality is that overall the conditions for trans people um, in this country, the violence that trans people continue to face, the murders of trans people, the majority of whom are trans women and femmes, the majority of whom are black and brown trans women, um, the continued barriers to healthcare, to jobs, to housing, to employment, um, to, to having access to income and food. The reality is that, that all of that has just continued during this time and worsened um, under the Trump administration. It has worsened during this time of a global pandemic. It has worsened during this time where we have seen an escalation of murders of black people by the police and the state and where we're in an ongoing climate crisis, right? So the, the overall picture for the trans community is that uh, the, our basic ability to survive has continued to be challenged during this time. And what we have also seen, and honestly, it has been um, heartbreaking at times, is that broader movements, broader social justice movements, um, even at times the, the LGBT movement, again and again, even in this time of a global pandemic and crisis, continues to forget about trans people. So this is the kind of broader context in which trans communities um, exist. And, and what though we have also seen is that trans people, we have always taken care of each other. And that has never been as true as during this time. During this period of a global crisis, trans people all across the country organized to make sure trans people have food, housing, access to healthcare, protective equipment, Organizations all across the country from Brave Space Alliance in Chicago to House of Tulips in New Orleans to My Sister's House in Memphis to the Transgender Intersex Justice Project here in Oakland, California. The majority of, the, of these organizations led by black and brown trans women. So even in this time of a crisis, again and again, showing that we will show up for each other. So during, in the midst of all this, we launched the Trans Agenda for Liberation and, and Issa Noyola um, was very, very much a part of this. So this is a living and loving document. It is a blueprint for our movements. It lays out clear um, issue analysis, policy recommendations and calls to action, whether it might be to churches, to schools, 
to broader movements. And it has built off of years and decades of trans leaders all across the country coming together whenever we possibly could get the resources to do so, to assess the moment, to identify solutions and put out a vision. And most recently, really over the last two years, a national coalition of trans leaders from all across the country, the majority of whom are black and brown trans women, worked diligently to lay out an agenda, a platform for, for our liberation. And the last thing that I just wanna say is that what we've also seen during this time, what I've seen is that, that wins that I thought were, were so far off for our communities and for our people have been made possible. From the calls to defund the police, to abolish ICE and invest in our communities, in our health and our well-being, and those campaigns winning, right? From Minneapolis to Oakland, all across the country. Like I think what we're also seeing this during this time is what is possible is so much more than I have ever seen before. And to what Kira was saying earlier, like it really is about us investing in the leadership of black indigenous people of color communities, of women, of trans women and femmes, of trans and non-binary folks, migrants, people with disabilities, people living with HIV, youth and elders, of investing in the leadership of some of the communities who have been most targeted and under attack in this time. And that that investment, um, there, there is so much more possible than I've ever seen before in this time. Thank you, yes. Chris, thank you. Thank you for, um, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I, I uh, wanted to turn um, to, to Issa before I, I pick like uh, one or two questions as time permits um, to, to all of you together. Um, so, so Issa, you've been a leader in, in, in the, the, the LGBTQ world, in the Latinx community, the women's movement, you know, in so many different different areas. Um, and of course, both the LGBTQ community and the Latinx community are, you know, are far from monolithic, you know, are multi-layered, multifaceted. Um, and so, but when with that in mind and with that very much a reality, I'm wondering, and I'm also thinking about just, you know, in California, as we see, you know, the Latinx, you know, population continue to grow and grow and grow. Um, as I think that you know, we all know, and tremendous demographic shifts. Um, where do you see some of the the opportunities you know, in this in this moment for the LGBTQ Latinx community in particular? Um, like so many of the panelists have already shared, it's it's the opportunities exist, um, especially in in doing this work um, intersectionally. Uh, the the fight for our liberation um, is is on on all of our backs and for all of us to continue to fight for none of us are free until all of us are free and so I think that um, the criminalization of our communities continues the targeting um, by police the targeting by the state detention centers continue to be filled um, you know we we see we continue to see. Uh, LGBTQ youth being profiled and being targeted um, in various ways. And so I, you know, the Latinx community is a part of all that. And I think we're fighting alongside everyone else in this moment where there's huge opportunity, where we've seen the emergence of leadership and exciting and, and um, possibility in so many ways. We've seen from climate justice with the Sunrise Movement of of young people leading that charge, right? Um, to uh, folks in the reproductive justice movement really um, standing up and really making the connections to uh, racial justice and repro justice and, and queer and trans justice, right? And so I, we need more of that. We need more of uh, Latinx folks to stand up for black lives. Uh, we need uh, queer and trans folks to stand up against police violence you know, there's just so many opportunities and we've seen um, at Mi Gente, we've, um, we have, uh, we run a three-pronged strategy um, that looks at different possibilities in each of these buckets within outside of the state. How do we um, think about autonomy? How do we think about our communities um, that are um, taking care of themselves, that are thinking about 
um, growing our capacity in um, safety and in taking care of ourselves and our health um, and practicing um, indigenous wisdom, right? Um, also within the state. So uh, that's where kind of our electoral work uh, comes in, right? And, and where we're, why we're running candidates, why we're interested, why, you know, uh, several years ago we were, uh, we, we said yes to Stacey Abrams and was running a, a Latinx uh, ground campaign to vote in Stacey Abrams, which started a lot of the get out the vote effort for Latinx communities for Stacey Abrams. Um, and also why we were endorsing uh, various sheriffs in um, black sheriffs in North Carolina who were saying, uh, who were standing up against 287G agreements that um, it's the agreement that uh, police and immigrant uh, and uh, ICE, uh, the collaboration, right? And so they were saying they were against those things, right? And uh, we've seen great success and, and there's still challenges in that, right? There's still so many challenges that what we're seeing in Georgia. Um, that's why we, we are throwing our hat into this. The election is, is not over actually. And there's so much at stake with the two Senate seats in Georgia and why we are going to be focused on that in the next several weeks to get out the vote of the Latinx community for the two candidates, uh, because so much is at stake in the Senate, right? If we want to expand the court, if we want to think about the Equality Act, uh, we need to kind of throw down in the next several weeks um, because there's so much at stake. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say, you know, against the state, that's like kind of like our bread and butter sort of, uh, you know, tactics that Mi Gente um, is known for. We've come out of the Not One More movement um, to end all deportations against um, everyone and ending of all uh, detention centers. And, you know, that is sort of our commitment continues to be to hold the, the system accountable mm -hmm. uh, for all of the devastation, for all the human rights violations that continue to happen, that still out of all the deaths that have happened inside detention centers, no ICE has not taken accountability um, for the young children that have died at the border, for folks that continue to uh, migrate with um, only to meet uh, you know, agents at the border, CBP, um, who turn them away, right? Um, seeking asylum. Uh, so that, you know, the United States still represents a beacon of, of um, LGBT possibility uh, who are, you know, there's still folks, uh, queer and trans folks from around the world still look to the United States um, for that possibility, um, for that liberation, for that freedom. And so we have a huge responsibility here um, to continue to fight, to continue to resist. Well, thank, thank you. And uh, gosh, there's so many directions to, to, to go with that. Um, I want to take half of a step back. It actually picks up on this some things that, that Issa, you were talking about and, and, and actually each one of you, each one of you touched on, but I wanna just you know, speak, you know, you know, ask about it directly. So the four of you make up an incredible array um, of, of, of leaders, a powerful and inspiring group. And each one of you also identifies um, as a person of color. Uh, and in 2020, I hope that you know, all of us know and that everybody who is you know, part of this tonight knows that racial justice needs to be at the top of the national agenda um, and of our movement's agenda as well. I want to know, how do each of you see, and I, I understand this is another totally unfair question because it's, it, it, it's giant, um, but a couple of reflections each about how you see the LGBTQ movement you know, at this moment with all that has happened, embracing and failing to embrace racial justice as a, as a core part of, 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 of what we're all about. And any of you can, can, can lead off with, 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 with that one. And then, and then I'm gonna move on to questions from, uh, that we've gotten from the, the audience. So, Imani, you look like you're about to say something. <laughs> Sure, I'm, I'm happy to start us off. So, you know, honestly, I'm thrilled that we are starting to have more collective conversations about the intersections of LGBTQ identity and racial justice. Um, this is something that many of us experience every day. So when I talk about this, I always wanna be really clear that this isn't, this isn't new for everyone, but there definitely has been a change in the way that, that a lot of people are talking about it. And that, is that's exciting. There's there's opportunities there, and so um, 
you know, we talk about um, being intersectional. We've talked about that um, over and over again, but we have to be really clear that when we are talking about being intersectional, it's not just that we're saying people with multiple underrepresented identities have a difficult life. Um, when we're talking about intersectionality, we are talking about the systems that are in place that actually make it difficult for everyone to thrive and get to liberation. And that's what we need to start working on is um, how do we get folks from falling through the cracks? People that don't receive the benefits or can't access supports that they should um, access the supports because these weren't created for them. And so when we think about um, the fact that black and brown trans women don't file hate crimes because when they look for um, support, they're mocked or not believed or further assaulted. Um, and then we see that someone looks at hate crime numbers and they say, oh, hate crimes against trans women are going down. That's an intersectional fail. And that is specifically to do with racial justice and it's to do with gender justice. And so when we're thinking about this moment, I think it's really important that we put that frame in there that we are talking about a variety of things. But um, folks are, are starting to think about this for the very first time. And too often we assume that, um, that when someone identifies as an LGBTQ person, that they can't also actively be participating in oppressing other groups. And that is not true. That is not true at all. And that is something that we really do need to put a pin in and say that that's not even, that's not how oppression works, you know? And so um, people in the LGBTQ community, we experience discrimination based on all parts of our identity even within the LGBTQ community and by, by LGBTQ people. And it's dangerous when we think that, that folks that don't, that um, experience discrimination can't actively participate in that. And so we need to be really, really careful there. Um, racism is something that's, that's insidious. And so we have to work incredibly hard to make sure that our movement is going to be anti, um, an anti-racist movement because that's the only way we're gonna get to equality. Um, and so that's, you know, like that's why we need to do intersectional work. You know, um, we can't get to LGBTQ equality if people of color are being killed because of racism. That is part of the LGBTQ fight too. Um, black and brown trans women are disproportionately harassed and killed because of their race and their gender identities and their murders often go unsolved. We have to do better at considering a racial justice, um, I, racial justice identity along with LGBTQ equality if we're actually going to get to, um, uh, to consider all of us. And so this is representing a really important moment. Um, I, it's, you know, but let's also be careful. We have seen this before too. We wanna make sure that when we come out of this moment that we are actually getting closer to justice, that we are, that we are, um, that we're looking at solutions. We're not, we're not finding these one-offs, you know, very often we'll have a lot of talk about, you know, these um, racial justice plans that we don't see anything um, come of, uh, liaisons that, that show up, that it's just one person that's supposed to represent an entire um, community. Yes, I see you're laughing. I mean, because y'all, that's how they, that's how they get us, you know, and that's not, that's not going to get us to liberation. That doesn't help us at all. And so let's be really careful that when we think about this, what we're trying to get to is structural su supports is going to change us going to change where we're at. We want to look and see that we are actually seeing um, LGBTQ people of color in better positions. We want to see uh, us actually getting to results, not just these these sort of one-offs. We need system change, not um, uh, not just change in, in one person representing a community. And so we want to be really careful there. That's great. Thank, thank you. And um, I, yeah, I, want to, I just wanted I to say. add to what Amani was saying. I, I just I think everything she said is right on the money. And I think we have to name racism that shows up left of center, right? Like we love to talk about the racism on the right, right? It like conservatives in whatever party that's not ours, right? But But I think what is so like Imani, like when you say we, it, it is so like, like we have to be, have to be intentional, right? About how we address it, right? Like, and we have to name it, right? Because it's, it's even harder for us to um, be able to touch, right? And, and diagnose and prescribe the solution for left of center racism, <laughs> right? Like, you know, literally, I, I come from the women's movement before um, coming into the task force. And, you know, people be like, well, I voted for, for Hillary. And it's like, 
that's not your I'm not a racist free card. Like it doesn't work that way. The fact that you voted for Hillary doesn't make you not a perpetuator, right? Like of racism, right? When we talk about institutional white supremacy, right? Like some of us are like live in organizations that are 50 years plus years old, right? Hundreds of years old, depending on what movement you're in. And white supremacy becomes ingrained in the DNA regardless of who is at the helm, right? Like, so we have to, we have to, we've got to name those things. We've got to talk about the internalized racism. We've got to talk about people who, you know, say all the right things and then treat grantees like they're, they're consultants, right? Like it's, it's a, it is an epidemic, right? Like people have learned to talk a good talk, right? But then, but then how, like, we've got to create more spaces and places to have the challenging conversations, right? And and what that means um, to, to be that vulnerable, I, I, you know? And again, it's not about, like for me, it's not about Trump Trumpers. Like that's not like, I come in contact with racism and white supremacy every day within like the left of, left of center communities, right? Like, and, and that's the stuff that we gotta, that that's, you know, we like to use that as a distraction and we, and, and we just, we got to get into it. Yeah, I just want to uh, continue with that thought that I, it is, there's so much at stake. Um, and when we fail to address the internalized racism, the internalized transphobia, the xenophobia, you know, we, um, we continue to perpetuate it. And just because we are, don't see ourselves um, like actively engaged in that, or like, that's not me, I voted for Hillary or whatever it might be, right? I, I or I'm a Democrat or I, or I donate um, and think that that's it, that we actually um, are failing to see the bigger picture. And I always say, I think, deten you know, working in detention issues for so many years, what I learned and what I saw inside detention was um, a magnification of all the sort of like the larger systems of oppression that exist and it's so, is just so magnified inside a prison context or detention context. Um, the transphobia, the way that folks are um, isolated, the you know the the torture sort of, and, and the ways that folks are denied care, the the basic needs that are that are denied, and the humanity that is being stripped away on a daily basis. Um, and on a, outside of that, we do that to each other. We do that in our larger neighborhoods, in our communities, without realizing. Uh, because it's not maybe as extreme, um, and you know, I think to me the 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 what what the cost of not doing that is that we continue to see you know the increased deaths of trans women around the world. We continue to see um, our communities devastated by um, you know uh, climate disaster. We continue to see um, homeless communities. Uh, being neglected, right, and th those com and those communities um, just being tokenized, um, and so you know we have to think outside the box as the LGBT movement to see ourselves not just um, as a silo, but as a part of the other movements and um, the contributions that we can make um, when addressing, when thinking about housing, when thinking about climate justice, when thinking about reproductive justice, um, when thinking about disability justice, and so. There's just so much at stake for all of us. Um, and there's a lot of wisdom that we can share as well. Um, and that is why like I have, you know, branched out and um, been in spaces that are not necessarily the, the, you know, the most safest spaces for trans women because of the transphobia, right? Um, that exists in the feminist movement, that exists in cis spaces, right? And so, um, I'm constantly challenged um, to speak truth to power in those spaces, but I just know that like um, we continue to carve a way where there is no way. And I think that's the tradition, the legacy that so many of our ancestors left us. Um, all of us are here beca uh, you know, because of that. Well, I, can I just jump in really quickly, Roger? I know you okay. I can tell you want us to move okay, on. Because I really got to get to more questions from the yes, audience. So go go for it. Perfect. Well, well, so very quickly. So, you know, I mean, I've been in the LGBT movement at this point for over two decades. And like, as an LGBT person of color, I know that black and brown LGBT people forever 
have been saying that the LGBT movement needs to center racial justice, right? It needs to center black and brown people and leaders. And I will say that a shift happened this year. I, I felt a shift where organizations and leaders that I never thought were actually saying the word white supremacy, right? Like organizations were actually saying, we shouldn't be calling the cops on people who come to our organization and we're gonna make a policy around that, right? Like there was absolutely a shift. And what I fear, what I fear is that with the defeat of Trump that folks are going to let up and ease off. And so I, I just feel like we need to really go deeper that there's an opportunity. There has been a shift that's happened and we just need to go deep with that and continue it and really hold all of our institutions accountable um, to really showing up in the ways that we always needed to for LGBT folks of color. Well, thank, 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 thank you, Chris. So I want to just uh, I want to move to a, a few of the questions that we have, we have received. I want to say that we actually received a lot of questions that were around uh, racial justice and racism, you know, in the movement. And so that was actually kind of a, a segue into that. Um, so I want to ask probably the number one question that, 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 that we heard from people, which is basically, and I'm going to make it really short, what about the Supreme Court? Um, you all know the, the, the lay of the land, you know, every bit as well as I do. I don't need to say anything more. Um, but if, you know, maybe, uh, you know, one of, of you or two of you could just speak, you know, briefly to that, um, that's on a lot of people's minds. Yeah, mind Could you me? repeat that? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, basically about the Supreme Court and, and with the increasingly right word tilt, what do we do? So Imani? Sure, you know, honestly, we are in a difficult spot with the Supreme Court. Um, there's a super majority of conservative justices on the court. And um, not only does that not reflect our population, but it's bad for LGBTQ equality. And that's something we're certainly concerned about. Um, there has been a, a, a lot of talk about court reform or so-called court packing. Um, and that's definitely something we would want to consider to make the court more equitable. That would mean adding more justices. It could mean term limits. It could mean a variety of things, but changing things up. And just to be clear, these are this is things that has happened to the court before. And this, this would just be to make the court more just in general and not because of how it is like exclusively because how it affects the LGBTQ community. And I wanna be really clear there. Um, a super majority, it doesn't represent the best of all of us at our highest court. And so, um, and I also know that folks are thinking about the fact like the way that this happened, how the current current justices were placed on the court too, that that doesn't feel fair to everyone just by way of process. And that's something that's concerning. Um, now, the problem with this is, of course, that court reform is something that um, isn't an option without um, a different, like, with the current makeup of the Senate. So that's why this Senate race in Georgia is so important. And so, and that's why folks are paying attention to it. But there's other options to protect our community. You know, there are executive orders that can be um, used to support our community. Um, the, the new administration can roll back some of the anti-LGBTQ rules that were brought on by the Trump administration, like the asylum room rule that made it virtually impossible to um, for LGBTQ asylum seekers to come to the United States or the homeless shelter rule that keeps transgender women out of um, women's shelters, making them much more um, likely to experience um, violence. There's still a lot of things we can do, but court reform is a big deal for all the reasons that we think. Well, great. Well, thank you. And I want to stick to the, um, the kind of the national scene for, for a quick moment here. And, and maybe Kira, you can speak, speak to this with the, the, the task force's focus. Uh, but the, the Biden administration, the incoming Biden administration, has, has indicated that the Equality Act um, to ensure non-discrimination you know, in many categories you know, is, is high on its agenda. Um, knowing that you know, we're all going to be looking very hard and, and at, at Georgia you know, come January, but could you just give, give some perspective on what you think the, 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 the possibilities are for sweeping non-discrimination uh, legislation making it to the president-elect's desk. I mean, I, I, I mean, I basically could just replay what Amani just said. I mean, it matters. <laughs> Georgia matters. It really, really matters. 
Um, and, you know, and, and the conversation kind of that or something I said earlier around changing um, the narrative about what's at stake for LGBTQ people, right? Like, being able to tell our own stories, being able, go pee. Um, <laughs> that was amazing. Um, but, 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 you know, changing the face of, um, or, or changing the narrative about, about what is at stake and, um, you know, people, it's like, I'm surprised at how surprised people are that queer people can still be fired from their jobs, right? That they can still be denied health care. That they, you know, um, that they can be denied services, um, you know, if they're homeless, right? Shelters, right? People are, they really don't know. Like, they really don't know. And they're surprised about it. So we've got to do that work to, like, tell the story of what discrimination is really happening and the impact on our communities. Um, and, I mean, I, 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 I think... Um, well, I mean, I'll stop there. I mean, I, I, I do. I think we've got to um, we've got to do that work. And, and I think, again, the, the broader democracy work, like how do we get more of our people engaged in civic engagement? Right. Like not, I don't mean just election season. Right. But they're engaged with their state legislators. They're engaged. Right. Like at the state level, at the local level and at the national level, that's all going to make a difference, too. Thank you. Thank you. So we've had, had several questions that fell along the, the following lines, and I'm, I'm kind of combining you know, questions as best I can. Uh, we've all been so focused in the last four years, of course, on you know, fighting whatever crazy thing happens you know, each morning that we, that we wake up. Uh, and as you think about from, again, the perspective of today, and you think about like, you look a little bit longer term, what do you think are one or two of our movement's greatest challenges over the next 10 years. So we think a bigger picture, longer term. And again, a number of folks were, were inquiring about, about that. I, I mean, I, I, would, I think, I could, go ahead, Issa. Sorry. So, I would, I mean, I would just say, I think it's just, um, settling for the status quo and kind of us um, uh, being accepted and, and kind of within middle-class culture wars, right? Like the, you know, the fact that, oh, we are in pop culture and that we are in magazines and that we have um, representation in this way that is uh, static from the reality of those most directly impacted by state violence. Um, I remember when I first started at Transgender Law Center that um, when we were started the campaign to end detention for trans communities, it was like crickets in the room and it was very controversial. It wasn't something that was actually very popular. Um, mm. I also you know, remember being on this panel several years ago and I you know, talked about anti-Blackness within the community. And again, it wasn't necessarily something that people were like, not, you know, like it was a little bit like, oh, what, what, why are we talking about anti-Blackness within the queer and trans context, you know? And so I, I hope that we think about uh, those that we are, don't see, you know, those that are inside detention, those that are, uh, that are in the border, those that are fleeing violence, um, those that are in communities that are not visibilized, um, because I don't think we can actually um, be think of the full vision of liberation that our ancestors talked about without that. And so mm -hmm. um, my hope is that we can all uh, find our humanity uh, inside of that. Thank you, thank you. So did anybody else, Imani, do you wanna jump on that? I did, you know, I wanted to say, because I see one of the questions in here um, that I, I wanted to um, 
to just speak to. So um, when I think about the movement, I see us being more inclusive and intersectional. Um, I wanna see a greater commitment to racial justice, to gender justice, to disability justice, to economic justice, and all forms of oppression in our fight for LGBT equality, because this should be for all of us. And one of the questions I see um, this person saying, I'm a white butch lesbian divorced, um, uh, I'm newly out, can I still be accepted in the LGBTQ community and get involved even with a strong emphasis of BIPOC or um, uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color, et cetera. And I wanted to speak to something like that because it is something that I'm hearing and out. You know, I wanna say, yes, there is plenty of room for you. There is, there is so much room. And the thing is, when we talk about including more folks so, it's in, so that it's inclusive, inclusive, it's not leaving anyone out, it's bringing more folks in. There is, there is so much room for you. I'm gonna put my email address in the, in the chat and I want, you to, I, I want you to send me an email, let's talk tomorrow. And I wanna tell you all the ways that this movement has, um, has room for you, how, how your liberation is directly tied to my liberation. I take that very, very seriously. And so when we talk about um, including more folks that include um, people of color, it's because in our LGBTQ movement, so often people of color have been left out that there hasn't been a focus on racial justice. And so when we talk about LGBTQ equality, that hasn't included people that experience discrimination that's based on race. But as a white butch lesbian, we get so much room for you like we have so much room for folks and the idea that we have to that that um that talking about more people talking bringing more people in is pushing more folks out that's not how this that's not how equality works like the more the more that you feel supported the more that i feel supported like this is this it only gets better when we bring more folks so i'm gonna put my i'm gonna put my email address in here um Esther, I want you to I want you to write me. I want you to write me. Let's call tomorrow and talk about all the space there is for both of us in this movement. So I want to pose. Um, I, I have the most unfortunate job of, of, of being the person who has to keep an eye on on, on, on the clock. Um, and so, um, I, so I want to ask one one last question. So all of the people who have joined us, you know, tonight. I mean just by virtue of being on this, you know, are, are, are doers. They're you know, engaged, generous, wanting to be part of, of things. I mean, just very much like, um, that was a beautiful response, Imani. Thank you for, for, for sharing that. Uh, could you each share, again, considering it's like an audience of doers, one concrete thing that people in the audience can do to contribute to change and progress? you know, it, 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 to further the LGBTQ movement. And again, it's my last unfair question, mm -hmm. but, um, but again, it's a group of folks who want to make change. So Isa, I see you leaning forward. And so I'm gonna call on you first. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say Organize, organize, organize. I mean, why we, why mi gente uh, supported uh, Biden to, to, you know, in the election and why we were running um, in the electoral world was because we knew that um, a Biden administration would create all these organizing possibilities for us to make interventions um, that our communities um, are needing so desperately. And so, um, there is, there is multiple ways. Um, there's just like uh, Imani said, there's room for all of us. There's room for all of us to organize in so many ways, um, whether it's uh, like, in, you know, as an example within the, the, in the Georgia context, um, you don't necessarily have to be on the ground in Georgia to canvas. You can, there's like various uh, mass, uh, you know, uh, text, text banking opportunities, uh, phone banking opportunities, um, to really, uh, yeah, support the work that is happening there to make sure that we secure those wins. Um, there's multiple ways that your communities, um, even in just the community that you live in with your neighbors and in the, with the folks that surround you to talk about these issues that are happening that impact all of us, right? Um, when we talk about detention issues, it's not a far off thing, right? Um, and, or police violence, these are not far off things that like, because we're not like our friends are, are not impacted or our relatives, like that doesn't mean that we don't have to necessarily talk about them. So I think there's just multiple ways to be an organizer. 
Um, now is like the right time to jump in. Uh, there's plenty to do. Um, all of our organizations, like if you were to reach out, we'd definitely find something for you all to get activated and engaged. Well, well, well thank you. Organize, organize, organize. Okay, one thing from, from each of you, Chris, Imani, and, and I agree with I agree with Issa, um, and Georgia is where it's at. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff to do after January 5th. And from now till January 5th, I say get get it together, figure out if, if you're, if you want to get, put money, put, put money into Georgia. If you can get your butt to Georgia, get your butt to Georgia. If you can make some calls and organize from home, text, right? Like we've come up with so many funky, awesome ways, right? Like do it. Um, tell it on the mountain. I mean, it, Georgia matters what um and that and it's real um and so anything and everything you can do call your if you got people living in georgia urge them to get out again right this is an election that our people don't come to, they don't come out for these right it's gonna be a big push so if you got people in georgia give them a call and tell them to get their butts out there and um and 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 vote again in january yeah yeah, that's so, so important. It's going to be who gets out there, who gets out there, uh, Chris? Yeah, um, I'm going to say two things, sorry. Um, so one, definitely, I would say go to our website and check out the Trans Agenda for Liberation. It really is like movement brilliance um, and a really clear blueprint <clears throat> for, for everyone to follow. And then the second thing that I would say is go to the Trans Justice Funding Project website go to their map of trans organizations and find one in your community to support. Um, there's more kind of funding infrastructure for trans organizations than ever before, but folks need as much support as possible. Like there's the Black Trans Fund, um, just folks are needing that type of resourcing and support. Great, thank, thank you. Very concrete, I love it. Imani? I will just say, you know, something similar to what everyone else has said, and that is give what you can. Um, if it's your time, if it's your money, give what you can. But also when you're thinking about th this, I say, you know, it is not the... It, it, it's not the work of it's not it's not the work of people of color to um, to teach white folks. And if you have capacity, then go ahead and do that. And I am someone that has capacity. Like this is my life's work. And so I'm not saying go and ask people, but here's the deal. I have I have time. I have time. I have space. Like we are in this movement, and I will do I will do a lot for our liberation, y'all. And I have a lot of capacity there. Figure out where you have your capacity and give it and give it all you can. Well, I, I can hardly think of a better way for for us to, to bring this 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 part to a, to a close. Um, I am so grateful to each of you for not just your time, but your courage and your and your leadership. And you know, I know that you come in like day after day, night after night, week after week, and and you know, and often it is hard. Um, so I just want to thank you. And and I am sure that if if we were in a real room and not a Zoom room that you would be hearing resounding applause. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe you can like, you know, hear that in your heads, even if, even if, it's, even if it's not there. You know, leadership counts. And, and we all know also that, you know, anybody who is in leadership, nobody does it alone, right? And so I wanna give a little shout out also to the staffs of each of your organizations because they do awesome and incredible things all the time. And I want to give a little shout out to, to the, the volunteers who are on your board of directors and to all of the hundreds of thousands of people who support your organizations um, because you're critical and all of them are critical to making it all happen and our movement wouldn't be where it is without all of that. And that brings me back to actually for everybody, for everybody who has joined us here uh, tonight because, you know, it's strange not to see you. And I admit that I miss that. But I know that you are there. And I know that you are driving our movement, that, that you, you are fueling our progress, that you've stood fast for these difficult, sometimes very, very difficult years. And that you've dug deep in your pockets and you've given your time, your wisdom, you've given so many things to help bring about the good news that happened last week and other parts of good news. And without you, there's no movement. 
There's no progress. There, there's, 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 there's no community. And so deep in my, from deep in my heart, and I know that my staff colleagues and, and Horizons Board of Directors joins me in this, thank you. Together is the only way that anything happens. And you know, even if as what we see ahead you know, can look so daunting, and at times it absolutely does, look at what together we've been able to accomplish in this world. And so I wanna just bring this, this, this wonderful session to a close with a final thanks to our mar marvelous, marvelous panelists, but also with some bright hope for the future. I mean, eyes wide open. I mean, we've got challenges and some of those, they are big, big mountains for us to climb. But to also look forward with power and pride and justice and confidence that one day, Every LGBTQ person, and I mean all LGBTQ people, will live freely and fully. And so I wish everyone who joined us tonight, thank you for being with us. My apologies for all those who asked questions that we were not able to get to, sincerely tried. Um, but I wish you good health, warmth for the holidays, and again, from all of us at Horizons, thank you so much for being with us. Good night.